A gorilla was killed at the Cincinnati Zoo after it injured a three-year-old boy after the boy fell into the animal's enclosure. It was tragic that the gorilla was killed, but the zoo officials did the right thing because a child's life is sacred. Can you imagine an America when that was not true? Can you imagine an America when a child's life was so insignificant that he was intentionally put into the pen of a dangerous zoo animal? An America when a child was intentionally placed at the edge of alligator-infested waters to lure the ferocious beast for hunters. The University of Florida banned the gator bait shout and athletes from using it in 2020 as part of a bigger attempt to erase any emblems or associations with the cry's racist heritage. After defeating rival Florida State University in 1996, Lawrence Wright declared, Ain't a gator, you must be gator bait. While the cheer itself is not racist, the word gator bait is associated with old stories about black children being exploited as alligator bait. This was widely reported in the early 1900s, and there are some records to back it up. Alligator hunting was a large business and a lucrative trade in the 1800s and 1900s. The skin from these creatures was used to manufacture belts, bags, shoes, and other highly sought after things. The white settlers saw the land and its wealth as unlimited, so they would continuously deplete its resources. Whether that meant mining, agriculture, or hunting wildlife, crocodile and alligator hunting was a highly popular activity in the late 1800s and the early 1900s among all exotic leathers both alligator and crocodile skins were very expensive and well like products but the only way to get these skins was to hunt wild animals and since the demand for the raw material went up the rich were willing to pay good money for it this meant more and more people were eager to take the deal rifles muskets and shotguns were common weapons in the 19th century. I'm not referring about the fast-loading, quick-shooting weapons of today. This is 19th century technology with simpler and older mechanisms. Most of the time, you had to load the muzzle with gunpowder before you could aim and shoot. Many people without military expertise could only accomplish two rounds per minute. Some weapons that use the tiny ball, which is a low hollow-based bullet, were designed to load quickly, yet even with such weapons, Alligator hunting was never easy. White hunters would often lose an arm or leg, and in some cases their lives trying to catch and kill these predators. As a result, they decided to use bait to draw alligators out of the swamps and make them into easy prey. However, this was no ordinary bait. According to others, young black toddlers were frequently utilized as bait to trap these apex predators. This might have happened in Louisiana, Florida, or anywhere else in the South. White guys would come and abduct the kids, sometimes in broad daylight and sometimes when the moms were not looking, and take them to the swamp, place them in pens, or tie them with ropes, and leave them right next to the alligator's den. It only took a few minutes. The alligators would emerge and pursue their victim. In the American South, such a deep level of racism was prevalent. It was frequently used to attract tourists, making it a popular destination for white hunters. During the Jim Crow era, African Americans were frequently abused, beaten, and killed in the most heinous ways imaginable. If there was a way to oppress, mistreat, murder, or exploit black people, they would find it. The atrocities were unending, and they were a daily part of life. Some reports show that black children being used as alligator bait really happened. It happened to real people, even though it might not have been a highly common practice. It did happen in some regions, especially in the South. Black people were viewed as subhuman, worthless, and savage, and the lives of animals were valued more highly than the lives of black human children. Experts discovered a couple of news articles from the 19th and 20th century that contained evidence of this heinous crime. The children employed as bait were most likely not newborns. They were taught to rush out and sit or make noises at just the appropriate moment. The hunters would shoot as the alligator rushed out of its hiding area, creating the ideal opportunity to catch the alligator off guard. In a 1908 Washington Times article, the name Picatinny is used to refer to a black child. This was a stereotype used to denigrate black children. White people used the term when they intended to talk about something practically inhuman, unkept, and dirty. It was something disposable. Even in popular media, this was a prevalent image. 
According to the newspaper, Azuki perplaced you and two black youngsters in a paddock with around 25 alligators and crocodiles. Hungry reptiles began chasing the children. This was a trick they used to get the reptiles back into their tank so tourists could see them in the summer, but there was more to it. In another article from the Richmond Times-Dispatch, published in 1919, we can see that the white community was not pleased with Florida authorities' decision to prohibit the use of African-American youngsters as gator bait. Then it goes on to blame these children for the abrupt absence of alligators, claiming that they ate the picatinny and developed digestive issues as a result. Another article from the St. Louis Republic, published in 1902, described all of the floats in the city's Veiled Prophet Parade. The Veiled Prophet organization was a secret society established by a former Confederate soldier. He organized this parade to pick the history of the Louisiana Purchase. Articles were not the only type of information that would cover the horrible imagery of alligator baits. Postcards, branding, posters, and mementos are all examples of the same phenomenon. These postal cards were the equivalent of text messaging at the time. They were inexpensive and practical to produce, allowing them to reach a wide audience at the time. They were intended to be mailed as commercial advertisements. Many of these postcards were printed with miniature designs or sketches, known as vignettes, and a message on the back. Initially, the cards were only available in black, but as time passed, they became increasingly available in color. At the period, store shelves were adorned with ornamental artifacts. These antiques are brightly colored and intricately designed, and they don't shy away from America's horrific past. Many of these artifacts can be seen in the Jim Crow Museum of Racist Iconography. This was a system that was built on itself to build and maintain a society trapped in a vicious circle of racial hierarchy. Popular rhymes and melodies also incorporated gator bait. Take, for example, Henry Wise and Sidney Perrin's Lullaby, Mammy's Little Alligator Bait, which was released in 1899. The lullaby instructs readers on how to sing and play a tune about gator bait. The lyrics are straightforward and easy to understand, and the music appears to be simple to master. Here's another one. This time, it's a poem, describes how a white hunter can't find a standard bait to catch a crocodile. But there are some black children playing around which can serve as the perfect replacement. He can place the child on a hook and lever to dangle over the swamps. The hunter waits and the tilting bait does its job and then swoops in for the kill. The white community could normalize their harmful and negative perceptions. It was used to convince people that these children had no rights and didn't deserve the respect. It was a way of normalizing and promoting behavior that would deny them basic human rights and dignity. Now, these stories about gator bait without a doubt reveal a deeply disturbing racism that was widespread in the American South. But many people believe that it is very unlikely that this thing actually happened. Although alligators can eat humans, they prefer to eat small mammals, snakes, turtles, rough fish, and birds. Given the choice, they would hunt for prey that's readily available. Furthermore, children of African-American origin were still valuable, so it would be absurd to take them to a swamp and tie them up in order to attract alligators. The owner would still value these children. They are not cheap. Will a slave master desire a disabled worker? A chicken would be a superior bait because it is inexpensive and effective. But when we consider lynchings, breeding farms, and other atrocities against black people, it's easy to see how the bait stories are just another part of our terrible history. So I believe the gator stories are true. White folks didn't want more black people born in their neighborhoods. So they would see this as a simple method to achieve what they want to make a point in times like this, where there would be no consequences. It was difficult to arrest, charge, or prosecute a white man for anything against a black man back then. People have harvested alligators in a variety of methods over the years. For good reason, the concept of alligator bait is difficult to grasp. Nobody wants to see children slain, but no one believes that alligator bait was a frequent practice. But if the story was depicted in a lot of newspapers, postcards, books, and trinkets, how can you argue it didn't happen? We'll never know for sure. We can unequivocally state that colonizers took the lives of innumerable black people. It ruined the lives of many and left both children and adults irreparably scored. This is the kind of history that shouldn't be forgotten. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below.
do hit the subscribe button and don't forget to share.